we're about to stumbling over Ms. Holly. Uh, <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. So what we were thinking, so because, you know, a number of our students have been with us for what, this is going to be the third year, and we've spoken so much about you, um, they've read so much about you and your work, um, and we kind of like run around the disciples of your work, but we haven't had a chance to meet you many of us. So I thought it would be really appropriate if folks got a chance to meet you now before your normal lecture. And I don't want to spend a lot of time on Dr. King's, Dr. Gordon's bio, because I think we all know that, because I think <laughs> we need the full hour and we have had to kind of talk about some of the stuff folks want to talk about. But I thought it would be cool if we just had an informal discussion um, about some of the contemporary issues that many of the students and so many folks have about race and education today, since that is the topic today in the lecture. Um, but then also to kind of talk about and kind of reflect on some of the thoughts you might have about UMI, about some of the work that you, you know, the work that, you, that you've done. Um, and just give, give these folks an opportunity to meet and greet and get to know you. The way Ernest and I and some of the other folks have. Which is, um, so I guess it would be best for them to go around the room and to introduce themselves about who they are, <coughs> what program they're in, and what work they're doing with UMI or hoping to do with UMI for the new folks who are coming. Because like I mentioned to you before, uh, they're doing some really great stuff, stuff that I know you've always dreamed of and you're doing, so it's nice to see you. Okay. So. Hi, Dr. Gordon. Um, I'm Chris Shirell, and I'm a first-year master's student here in the Sociology and Education Program. Um, Chris, I will ask you to speak up just a little bit. I'm yeah, two hearing aids, and I still can't hear. Definitely. <laughs> definitely. Um, it, you know, my name is Chris Shirell, as I said, and, and um, I am a first year master's student in the sociology and education program. Um, I hail from Atlanta, Georgia. I am in the big city for the first time in my life, and I tell you what, it's jarring. Everything is so fast. I'm trying to keep up. Um, I am currently working um, on the Beyond the Bricks uh, project here at UMA, and I'm hoping to work uh, with, with Veronica and others on other projects as well. Um, and again, just trying my best to get involved with Teachers College and some of the uh, programs that are here, specifically addressing um, uh, community uh, things within that realm. So, um, we'll look forward to it. Hi, Christina Villarreal, but um, I go by V. Uh, it's wonderful to meet you. Um, I'm a first year PhD student in the Social Studies education program, um, just moved here, also new to the city, from Oakland, California, um, where I learned so much from the young people there, and that's who I'm here for, not just the young people of Oakland, but the young people across this country, and so um, I'm currently working with uh, Jody Morell on the Literacy Teachers Initiative here, um, and hopefully we'll be able to make more connections into social studies classrooms um, specifically, and I'm uh, excited to be here. Dr. Gordon, it's an honor to meet you. Um, I'm in my third year here, I've been a research fellow with you for I'm going on my third year, so I've heard so much about you, and I've seen you in videos, and you know, we've all stalked you a little bit. Um, we're really appreciative of your legacy and the example you've left for us. Uh, I study literacy, um, I'm in the English Education Department, uh, PhD program, and I, I guess, run or organize the National Ethnic Studies Project, um, which houses a lot of my dissertation work, looking at college preparatory um, Latino studies, African American studies, Native American studies across the country. Um, I also run the Fairy Culture Circles uh, project that we have here, where we work directly with um, New York City, New Jersey's uh, public school teachers around um, emancipatory discourses, um, critical issues in education, and ways to better support teachers in the classroom. Um, and that's all. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Cynthia Cavajal. I'm originally from Guadalajara in, in Mexico, but I grew up in East LA for the most part. Um, this is my first year, master's from year of um, social, social uh, sociology and education, 
and I work in UB with Kathy in any aspect that she needs me. And um, I'm particularly interested in getting involved with programs, organizations that help um, with regards to accountability and equity for undocumented students that are pursuing um, college after K-12. Hi, I'm Christina Chase. I was born and raised in New York City. Um, I'm hoping, oh, my program is also sociology and education. Um, and I'm hoping to work with Kathy with her cultural circle, um, which is exactly what I'm interested in, is um, alternative spaces where we can bring in social justice pedagogy and cultural, I mean, critical education and have those discussions and figure out um, how to move forward with that, how to apply what we're talking about. And, um, and I guess that bridges to the other work I hope I'm doing, which is social outreach, to build stronger connections with activists in New York City that um, have been working on education issues for a while because there's such fragmentation among them and I feel like that's where we can really begin um, tying in students and teachers and workers. I'm Catherine Bolderides. I'm an NYU student. <laughs> <laughs> I had the pleasure and the privilege to um, participate in the Gordon Commission last, was it last time? A year? Um, and spent an incredible amount of time um, synthesizing papers that were written with them, going out to come on and spending time with Dr. Gordon and um, five other fellows and discussing the future of assessment and it was a powerful and a really wonderful opportunity that I appreciate and um, I'm here now um, <laughs> because I, well, I'm a fifth year doc student in sociology that I forgot that. I'm on, finishing up my Dissertation. Move from NYU to teaching. Well, <laughs> a couple days a week. Yeah, we're, we're working. <laughs> um, but it's all about spacing. But New York City and there's connections between. I'm at the Metro Center with Pedro Nogueira and here and um, was able, the doors are open and I appreciate that to spend some time here. So thank you. And Welcome. Work on whatever. <laughs> Um, hi, I'm Candace Banks. Um, I'm a first year master's student in the speech pathology program here at TC. Um, I'm from New Orleans, new to the city, so I'm getting used to everything too. Um, and what I really want to look at is how students who speak um, African American vernacular English, um, how they're faring in schools um, that put a lot of emphasis on standard American English. Um, and how sometimes they're held back um, when it's not a learning disability, rather just a cultural difference. Um, so yeah, it's good. Hello, Dr. Gordon. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's been a pleasure working directly through Veronica and through you with you. Um, as you know, I pretty much I'm the project assistant here. We do a lot of logistics set up for our events and conferences. I am finishing up a Masters of Divinity at Union Theological Seminary, and I'm particularly interested in how you are able to merge your, I know you have a background in ministry and policy, um, and I read some of the quotes that other people have said that you just have sort of a, a wonderful approach to a lot of the research you do, and I'm really interested in, in seeing how you've merged both of them throughout your scholarship and problems. Hi, Dr. Gordon. Uh, like everyone has uh, iterated so far, it's very much a pleasure to, to meet you and to see you in person as you definitely have inspired all of us to do the work that we do. And we've read so much about you and heard so much about you and seen so much about you. So to meet you really is a pleasure. So thank you so much for being here. Um, I am a first year doctoral student in the history and education program. Um, I did masters for the past two years at TC. So it's my third year at TC and uh, with Yumi. And I'm currently working on a project called Youth Historians in Harlem. And I'm working with a bunch of high school um, Harlem uh, youth at a local high school down the street, actually, and I'm having those youth do, quote unquote, the history of their community, um, participate in the historical process, and learn about their community um, um, themselves. And so it's been a very exciting experience to see them transform into young intellectuals as knowledge producers of history and to connect with their with, with their um, community which is obviously there's so much rich, rich history here so um, that's the project that I'm working on um, here at uh, here at UMI. Thank you. The lady who came in late is my assistant. 
Hi, um, my name is Paula Andrea Valencia. I'm 24. I graduated with an undergrad in sociology. I pursued a organizational leadership or um, organizational leader organization masters at Naya College, and now I'm looking for other opportunities that the professor is. It's training me and trying to mold into a lot of his ideas, just like you guys are doing, into what would be my, my doctoral degrees and stuff like that. So now I just have the privilege to work with him every day, <laughs> which is really an amazing thing. Do you want to Yeah, I'll just going to say something about Professor Morrell. Uh, <laughs> connect him and me. I don't know how many years ago it was now, but he was probably just finishing his doctorate when we first encountered each other. And he was selected as a postdoctoral fellow in a program the American Educational Research Association had developed. That we kind of lost touch with each other until the surface began the research committee here was trying to find someone to replace me, uh, ask if I knew Ernest Morel. <laughs> and of course my eyes lit up and they had the good sense and taste to ask him to come to teach us college, much to my delight. Uh, welcome. How long have you been here? Like two years? Yeah, three years. It feels like long. Right, right, right. If you want to say something about yourself, help yourself. Oh no, I, I, I know these people. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and around that, okay. uh, I assume that they know who you are. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. One of you suggested something for me to talk about, and I'll talk about that briefly. But I much prefer that you talk to me about the things that you are concerned with than my telling you something of what I, I know. So after responding to that question about how I integrate ministry into the rest of my career, I'll invite you to take another second or two. All of you don't need to speak, but if two or three of you will tell me what you want to hear about, I'll see if I can talk about uh, those sorts of things. But on the question of uh, religion and the rest of life, I guess it is, which is the way I review religion. I am an ordained Presbyterian minister, but I tell my children that I lost my traditional beliefs in Christianity as a form of religion uh, while I was in divinity school. I found it difficult to study theology, its uh, history, and the many manifestations of human beings' uh, search for meaning uh, through deistic and theological concerns. I found it difficult to uh, take any one of them as uh, superior to uh, any of the others. There are at least a dozen different belief systems in the world. And all of them make sense in some context. Some of them are more attractive to some of us than others. But as I see it, no matter which of these religions you turn to, they really are associations that represent associations of people who are trying to make sense out of the world and trying to find ways in which that sense of what the world and human beings are all about has to say for how they all manage their own lives. And whether uh, it's uh, Judaism or Christianity or Muslim or Buddhism or Confucianism, you will find a lot of recurrence that are very similar to run through them. So that by the time I had finished uh, divinity school, uh, I was no longer content to be a traditional practicing Christian minister, but was no less 
spiritual than I was when I came into Divinity School as a very devout uh, uh, Christian. And as I chose the behavioral sciences as my area of work, I didn't see the study of them as being very different from my study of the theology, except that in my theological studies, since I had done it through the uh, prism of uh, Christianity, it was much more ideologically limited. I found some of the same ideological limitations in the behavioral and social sciences, notions that we just know to be correct and everything else must be wrong. But the more I studied them, the more I, studied, I realized that the reservation I was beginning to develop about theology also applied to these other ways of knowing sociology, psychology, anthropology, economics. They are efforts, again, like those in religion, of trying to make sense of the world and to figure out how things fit together, even how we can predict things, and some of us are trying to control things. But as you study these areas more carefully, you begin to recognize that there are contradictions between these uh, many of the ideas that surface in these various epistemologic uh, contexts. And the task of scholarship, it seems to me, increasingly is the task of reconciling the contradictions and paradoxes between them. And the even more difficult task is holding on to any one of them while you have to be aware of and sensitive to all these other perspectives. So as a psychologist, I can't be indifferent to what the economists are doing, what the political scientists are doing, or the sociologists, or the anthropologists. And I find myself better able to make sense of things across these various disciplines, these various lenses through which to see the world. But for me, the unifying stream is the stream that I kind of began with, and that is trying to understand how what on earth it means to be a human, and what my responsibility to other human beings is. And a lot of what I learned as a child in Christianity, and a lot of what I see in Judaism and Islam, Confucius and Buddhist thought is equally useful in trying to figure out how do I treat this woman or this person who's next to me or the group of persons for whom I'm responsible. So I like to think of myself as still very much a preacher, a minister, but I don't necessarily have to convince you that Christianity is the way, but I respect all these other ways if you see as our common cause, our common search is for the meaning of things and particularly what that meaning has to say about how they relate to you. So what else should I talk about? Um, we would love to hear we would love to hear about um, maybe some lessons uh, or conversations um, that you had with your with your friend W. Oh, well, that was really one of the highlights of my life. I often confess that I have been uh, blessed. I've never had a hungry moment in my entire life. I've never had to work on work I'm going to stay or I'm going to be cared for in terms of my health. But I also had a remarkably rich set of encounters with people. And I think Du Bois, the encounters with Du Bois is probably at the top of that list. But I knew the Franklin Frazier, I knew Howard Thurman, and Benny Mays, both of them are outstanding African-American theologians. I met Du Bois because he was the neighbor in Brooklyn 
of the man who headed a clinic where I was chief psychologist and the book book. This was about six years before the boys decided to leave this uh, country for, for Ghana. And we met quite uh, socially, but we kind of hit off a friendship so that for the last five years that he lived here, we had dinner two or three times every month. He often spoke at a labor hall up in Harlem, and whenever he was going to be there, I managed to be there. And of course, since I had met him as a graduate, and he spoke once at Howard, and I was too unsophisticated to even know, much less appreciate, uh, who I was listening to. This time around, though, I took him seriously. <laughs> Went back and began to, began to read all of his stuff. I don't even know which of the encounters to tell you about one of them, which I most often think about, and particularly in the context of uh, race, was one night up on the 125th Street at uh, Leonard Simon Avenue. There used to be, be a labor hall where he spoke there two or three times. But he was saying that he thought that he had been right in. 1903, when he made the argument that the color line was the problem of the 20th century. But he said as the century was moving along, and this was interesting in 1954 or 55, he said that he was beginning to change his mind. He wasn't sure that the uh, color line or race was as critical as he thought at the turn of the 20th century. He said the problem of the 21st century will be the problem of the division between those of us who have and those of us who have. And there's so many things about Du Bois writing and his thinking that was anticipatory of what the world would become. Because while race or ethnicity or skin color is still very, very, very important in our society, pretty much around the world, it is really the division between the have-nots and the persons who have or those who control resources that is the most, most critical problem. <coughs> In this country, some of us can even look forward to the time when skin color will, be, will practically disappear as a social, social divider in part because of the uh, changes in the political economy, but also in part because of the demographic system itself. Somebody has published a composite of the dominant group in the United States in, I think, as early as 2050. And it's a person that would probably look a little darker than People that we currently identify as white will be declining, and people who are as dark as this side of the room will be fading out, and people who are brown skin will be the dominant people in this society, just as they are currently the largest number of people in the world. I think if Du Bois were alive, he would you know, say that we've got to begin to think about how the resources of the world and the power to control them are distributed because it won't be the uh, color that makes so much difference in who's in power and who's not in power. That's who controls the resources and the allocation of those resources. Now, that doesn't mean that we can afford to stop thinking about social uh, divisions because humans have ways of dividing us up. Uh, even when we look the same, if you go into West Africa and you look at the uh, facial markings of people, they've been created to distinguish between people who have the same biological characteristics but uh, different 
tribal identifications, other political identifications. And we have long had distinctions among very homogeneous groups between the people who control the resources and the people who don't control the resources. And throughout the world, we still destroy people on the basis, we kill people on the basis of our desire to control the resources that they the control of our ancestors. Some of the biggest religious struggles have used religion as the uh, adamant, but they have really had to do with uh, different religious groups who are fighting over who's going to control the resources. So that I often go back to uh, Du Bois in the discussions, but particularly his election that night. And he was calling our attention to the importance of the way in which power and resources are distributed as being the central problem for, for, for human beings. I don't, I don't we respectfully want to push back at you on that. <laughs> For a second, only because I, I was thinking about one of your other um, extraordinary partners, Kenneth Clark, and his doll study. And when we speak of race not mattering as much because of the emerging races, yet Kenneth Clark's study, 30 years later, maybe 40 years later, um, on the doll study, which many of us know, still confirms that race does matter and that. <clears throat> huge divisions that does make a difference. Well, it's so, interesting that you would raise Ken because mm -hmm. Ken was was almost racist <laughs> in the sense that he he never gave up his uh, concern with, with that issue, and his uh, agenda had to do with the achievement of racial equality. But he was also convinced that it had to be achieved through integration. He had serious questions with blacks who identified with the black nationalist movement because he thought we ought not be separating ourselves and identifying ourselves as black. We ought to be identifying ourselves as human and trying to get the rest of humanity to uh, accept us as such. But the difference between him and Du Bois there is that uh, Ken was very much uh, talking about his, his time at the present, and Du Bois was talking about the, the future. He wasn't suggesting that he was wrong on the uh, importance of the color line and its continuing importance, but he was looking to the 21st and 22nd centuries, and he was saying that the problem of those centuries is going to be this problem access to uh, resources. He hoped that the problem of race would be uh, declining, but at the time he was speaking and he thought for the rest of the certainly uh, 20th century that we would still be struggling with race and we found out even though we managed to put a black person in the White House. It's obvious that this society is almost prepared to see the society itself collapse in order to make sure that this black man doesn't succeed. That, I think, is what the current shutdown of the government is about. I don't think the Republicans are that much worried about Obama here, because it actually is their program that Obama embraced. But once this black man, who was the leader of the country, embraced it, in, wanted to put his uh, insignia on it, it becomes the worst thing in the world, uh, that segment of the population. And they appear to be ready to see the nation, if not the world, or the economic collapse, to make sure that this man does not succeed. So the race is still very, 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 very important. But Du Bois was talking about the, the future where he saw it declining in significance. It just happens that his prediction has accelerated. And that is because of the in 
that stages of capitalism that have uh, pretty much captured the, the world. Capital, capitalism is an economic system that's based upon the right of exploitation, my right to export your labor for my profit. And of course, it is a system that has a, has a score, its core value, uh, the maximization of profit. And if you want to maximize profit over a long time, the wealth of the society, particularly the surplus wealth, accumulates here, and the remaining wealth is inadequate to support the mass of people who it was that division that the boys was talking about when you said those who have not and the struggles for those who increasingly have. Now, I would think the boys anticipated another development that has accelerated it or exacerbated it. And that's the advent <coughs> of the computer. What we have with computers is the capacity of computers to manage machines and reduce the need for human labor. When you put that with Marx's notion of who controls the machines, control the world, they control the economy. If human labor is not needed to manage those machines, then humans almost become superfluous. Period that uh, the boys was worrying about was that period as human labor becomes becomes less and less sort of, uh, critical as machines become more powerful, and he didn't talk much about those machines being controlled by computers and by human beings. I remember one of his talks. He was talking about of the dams and the Midwest that uh, Roosevelt built under the New Deal, locking on the name of the particular one he was referring to, but this, the name, its name is not important. Its, its importance is that that dam displaced the need for about 10,000 workers in the production of electricity with about 700 workers who were needed to uh, manage this uh, dam that was at, at that time being controlled by very, very uh, primit primitive uh, computers that were still mechanically as opposed to electronically based uh, computers. The boys in one of his talks was talking about that being the future, a future where machines were more or capable of doing the work of human beings and being managed by them in a society where the, the ownership of, uh, of machines was still under private control. I remember a few years after I heard him give that talk, my wife and I were over in China and we were traveling by train I don't remember the points we were moving between, but I remember one week we were going north and there was a hill that looked like it was covered with ants from a distance, but it was human beings. And when we came back a week later, it was a plain. The, the mountain had been leveled by, by those human beings who were jumping over the ants. In the course of about the same period, this was in the late 50s, about the same late 50s, same period in this country, if you wanted to tear down the mountain, you push them two or three uh, bulldozers and you know, able to be able to. And I remember my wife uh, making the inquiry to the two of us of what would China would do as machines came into China and displaced those workers because at that time that's what human beings did, they worked. Now machines can do it as they were doing in this country. 
what happens to all of these working people. And that's, in a sense, the problem we are going to increasingly encounter if uh, Professor Morell happens to own the uh, machines and Veronica has the uh, computers that can operate together, then we need all of you. The, machine, the computers and the machines will, will do it all and the rest of us will have to stop. Sure how oh we were talking about race. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, I I I still need race is terribly important. I have a little bit of trouble with people who fire the banner of critical race theory because other than asserting that race is a central concern, I'm not quite sure where it takes us. And if I'm right that that is the core of that theory, it doesn't leave much room for the boys' prognostication with respect to it, as we'll be dealing with until the end of the century. Mm -hmm. Say that last part again. Say that last part again. That it doesn't leave, it doesn't so, leave enough so room all for... If you don't, um, catch what I say when I say that. <laughs> 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 I think that is Prognosis yeah. of his theory of what's happening in the future. In terms of class division, not race Yes, division. I was making the point that if I'm right that the core of critical race theory is that race is a primary concern in any analysis, in any effort understanding things. I have some trouble because it doesn't give leave of much space for the voice concerned with the distribution of power and resources. It doesn't mean that it has to have that limitation. If you go back to my earlier comment about multiple multiple perspectives and the challenge of holding an idea central problem one that examines a number of other ideas. A critical, a, a theory that makes race central but accommodates all these other perspectives that need to be taken into consideration would be uh, more acceptable to me. I'm wondering, what was something that you saw, or patterns you saw maybe in schools or in communities that most informed your work here at TC, or decisions that you made? I guess in other words, like, folks are coming in with all these different experiences and things that we might have seen given our respective experience, whether it be in school, in community activism and work, and I'm wondering just if you have like anything that sticks out in your mind, something you saw and you knew, okay, this is something that we need to address in the space of Teachers College um, and and why. You know in the old black minstrel shows, mm -hmm. there used to be a, a straight person and a comedian. The straight person asked the question that the comedian could then no respond to it to be the core of the entertainment. I should pay you as my street person. But <laughs> that question gives me an opportunity to talk, to talk about and I, a set of ideas that are very important to me. I, my wife and I moved to New York in 1950 from Washington, D.C. And we lived in New York City about three years. And I met a chap here at Teachers College who had discovered a cooperative and interracial. Most co-ops are interracial. Many co-ops are interracial. But it was a cooperative residential community about 30 miles up the river. It's called Skyview Acres. And we visited and the people made us comfortable. My wife happens to be the cashier. The certain racial community, so we bought property that joined that community. 
a lot of the people who were moving into Rockland County at that particular time came from the Lower East Side. They were second generation, second and third generation immigrants. Uh, most of them came out of marginal, economically marginal families. Uh, we're not terribly sophisticated, we're not terribly oriented to it, uh, intellectual and so we call high culture. I used to describe them as people who thought spending uh, a night out in New York City meant going to Radio City as opposed to going to the so-called legitimate theater. About 20 years after we moved there, I began to observe that these people, instead of reading the daily news and the big up folks were reading the New York Times, and instead of going to Radio City or any other movie you know, in Broadway, they were going to the theater and to the house. They were worried about the education of their kids. And as their kids graduated from high school, you know, they were struggling to get them into the Ivy League schools. These were the same people who we remember this arriving still in color, dirty behind the ears, and maybe a little bit smelly, but they were people who were trying to escape the lower class. The changes in the economy, the changes in their conditions of life, seem to be pushing them into the middle class. And if you look at that group now, they are very, 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 very much in the uh, middle class, uh, very sophisticated, uh, educated people uh, uh, living the good life. And looking at that, I began to think that my efforts at trying to desegregate education were not as important as uh, some other things. And those other things didn't have a lot to do with school themselves. I, never gave up the idea that improved schooling is good. But I'm convinced today that it is improvement in the conditions of life that make the difference. So that if I were Obama's Secretary of Education, I would join forces with uh, Health and Human Services and the Treasury Department to redistribute the wealth of the country so that they were not poor people, not people who were deprived of access to resources. That's my way of trying to improve uh, schooling. Now, if you go back and look at the available research, we have known for the last 75 years that family income is the best predictor of school achievement. So if I'm supposed to be improving education, people should just improve the conditions of life of people. My wife, who spent 12 years as on the local school board, doesn't like to hear me say this because she thinks it's uh, demeaning uh, the importance of public education and public schools. And I don't mean to do that. We need good schools because even rich people use good schools. They just don't use the public schools anymore. So we need to continue the struggle to make public schools good schools. But we put too much weight on schools to achieve our ends because the rich people are doing some things at home and in their communities and in the supplemental educational experiences of kids. So that I shouldn't say my career ended, but as I moved into retirement, I was pushing supplementary education more than I was pushing the quality of schools. Gordon, I'll see you at the reception. Okay. I don't have to talk in the next hour, do I? No. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. People uh, talk about you. Then, then, then stay as long as you want. I was going to say, if I had to make another talk, maybe I should stop. You know, Dr. Gordon, I have a question that I may have to read to help set up in a second. But, uh, you know, I worked in a uh, urban school last year in Denver. Um, and I've come here and I've started to study um, sociology and education, specifically uh, first semester with education policy issues. And looking at some of the policies that have taken place 
over the course of the 20th and 21st centuries. And I'm thinking to myself, looking back on my time in urban schools and hearing what you're saying about um, the advent of technology and how inevitably we're going to see that take more of a, um, a kind of a uh, prominent step in actually deciding how work is done and who is doing the work, controlling specific mechanisms, mechanisms to do said work. With regard to uh, access, opportunity, resources, and the distribution of such, how significant are grassroots efforts, given some policies that may not be as um, beneficial for schools in urban communities? That's a lot of disparities in um, schools that were eight miles outside of the school I was working in, Denver proper. Eight miles, you saw a huge stark difference in access and opportunity. Uh, and accordingly, you saw the demographic differences. Uh, I couldn't put a name to it. And now I'm beginning to put a name to it, questioning was my time in that urban school actually doing something of relative import? Um, so, with that said, succinctly put, are grassroots campaigns still a viable option to evoke some substantial change in our country, specifically in regard to education? I don't quite know how to answer that one because I'm uh, conflicted. Ideologically, I want to say that we should never give up on the democratization of participation in political decisions. And that's what we're trying to do with uh, grassroots. But many of the uh, common folk, many of the folk we are talking with and dependent upon from the turn to grassroots, our minds are so controlled by the dominant group, I find myself having reservations about whether or not I can depend upon them or even the democratic process to do the things I want to do. But for me, that's a very pessimistic view. But it maybe it's a realistic one. At an earlier period in human history, one could depend upon revolutions, revolutionary changes, and if you can get enough people behind the movement to change things. I must say, I have worried in 92, almost 93, I have worried that the ways in which the status quo has come to control all of the uh, material and political resources of the world, I worry that it's possible to make the kind of changes that we are talking about. And that's because I'm a pacifist. If you look at what's happening in the Middle East, I think uh, Bin Laden is, 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 is winning. And I say that because what Bin Laden was arguing was that it was the despotic leaders of the Middle East and the despotic leaders of the West in their efforts at controlling the natural resources of that region that were the problem. And even though we were able to kill him, kill him, and of course uh, reasonably effective and controlling the so-called terrorists, I think all of that movement is a reflection of what you're talking about, of the masses of people rising to say we want to control more of the resources that ought to be available to us. The big danger over there is that uh, the bus that has the military capacity to simply abolish that area 
could and very likely will do so if those grassroots uh, begin to, to be winning. It's not beyond our consciousness to use the nuclear bombs on the Japanese when they were trying to redistribute the control of the resources in Asia. And I think if the so-called Arab Spring were to succeed, not being so romantic about the goodness of that group, that they offer a lot of negative currents uh, there also that have to, have to be dealt with, even in that revolution were to, uh, to, to begin to win. But I doubt that it would win because I think that if it were, if it became a real problem, uh, we would not hesitate to use uh, Israel and the power of the United States to simply wipe it out. So I still believe in grassroots mass uh, democratic uh, action. I think the grassroots, uh, if we want to keep our hopes there, we've got to be much better educated than we uh, have currently been able to educate them and to educate them against great odds because Murdoch and that whole crowd is also trying to educate them. They are educating them to be us to be ignorant. But even if we are able to effect a successful grassroots movement, I don't see the concentration of economic and military power in the world the concentration and distribution of it in the world being such that uh, we could be guaranteed that it would not be used to destroy us. That's why I say it's pessimistic. Thank you. My wife and I have uh, four kids who we often talk to about things. And a few years ago, over dinner, they were kidding us, uh, suggesting that maybe we should not have devoted our lives to trying to make a difference in the world. My oldest son said, Dad, you did that time. It was 50 years uh, to the struggle, and it seems to be worse now than when you started. It's a kind of humorous exchange, but it's also a sad one. Despite all of the gains, I think the world is in a in worship in 2013 than it was in 1913. Well, it wasn't that old, say 1930, yeah, it's at least over that, no things were wrong. And we certainly have made some progress, but when you consider that in our country, which is one of us still will be you know, more resources passed through us, out through, through our control than probably any other place in the world. And we still have 26 million hungry children. This is absolutely wrong with that. And I don't see even under uh, Obama's, it's interesting that they thought of him as uh, progressive, under Obama's progressive leadership. It seems to get worse right over there. Not to mention what's happening in terms of Africa, but Asia, even China, which you know, suddenly is rolling in money. I was reading somewhere the other day that we have 300 million people in China who live in poverty. There's just something wrong with that. So I wish we could be more optimistic. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's about an hour. Well, yeah, welcome to talk with us if you like. Thank you. If anybody's got any burning concern, uh, raise it. Otherwise, I'm willing to quit. Um, I do have a question. Um, so you were talking a lot about 
how people are so um, content with the status quo, and I find that. So um, I went to Dillard University in New Orleans, and I found that a lot of my peers are, are very apathetic. And um, even when you, I come from a place where it's like, <laughs> If I know about something that I want to fix it, I, I have to find a way, but I find a lot of people are apathetic and they deal in uh, dichotomies. And so, do you have any um, thoughts on what it takes to create a critical thinker? And is that, can that happen at any point during your life? Or does it have to start early or it's not going to happen? Um, so just kind of your thoughts on that. I conclude the very last question. Yeah, I think human beings are yeah, always yeah. capable of changing. I think we are less likely to change, to change as we get older. And we are certainly less likely to change if the thing is working for us. So with the people you were referring to as being athletic, life is going pretty well for them. At least if they think it's going to work for them, you know, we are uh, 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 disrupted. But on becoming a critical thinker, one of the things I hold on to from my period as a Christian minister is the belief in redemption. And I think as long as you are alive, if you can possibly get your mind open, you can be, you can be redeemed. Let's make one other comment because it came at the beginning of your comment when you were saying if you know something you feel you have to act on it. When I was asked about my experience with experiences with divorce, I should have identified that belief of his as one of the things I learned from it. The boys believe that humans have a responsibility to know, even greater responsibility to understand to develop the critical capacity. But he said, if you know and you understand, you've got a moral responsibility to do something. Many of us don't do that. And even more of us don't know and don't understand. Misunderstand, you know, we do nothing. I wish more of us who knew who were acting, I wish all of us who understood too many of us who really understand choose to act not for the common cause, but for you know, protect me. Okay. <laughs> I, I want to follow up on Candace's question because I, I, I feel so much of what she's saying is so true. I mean, I see that in so many ways, not just in educators, but in folks from so many different fields who are witnessing this apathy. And so how do you, you mentioned they don't, they don't understand perhaps the moral responsibility of, of giving back, you know, that critical thinking or teaching or learning or whatever. How do you teach people the moral responsibility? I think that's my challenge, <laughs> is how do you teach masses of people who have become, I think, have become numb, many of them. Um, Maybe they were born numb because of their parental family, you know, situation. But how do how do you teach people? How do you awaken them to a moral responsibility? Well, I, think I don't really know that one. I think I. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't, who does, right? <laughs> I, I believe that people learn morality and decency from the lives that they do. And sex life for so many of us is either difficult or involves exposure to indecency. I think it's very hard to learn. One of the things I'm very much enjoying in my last quarter century is running into my former students and one of the great delights for me is seeing 
in talking with people who are talking to me about the way in which my life has influenced them. And what I'm beginning to sense is that most of us learn to be decent or moral from other significant people in their lives. When I retired from Yale in 1991, we had an event for me over at the Chamber, and my son was the last, my oldest son was the last speaker. And he said, one of the things I learned from my father was that there was no problem I couldn't solve if I were willing to put my mind to it. I remember that night talking to Susan about it, and I couldn't remember ever having said that to him or given him that as an example. But I can only remember that he modeled himself after what he saw his father do. And I think uh, what that says to us, to us who would be teachers, is maybe rather than trying to teach morality, to try to live moral lives, and try to influence other people. Because the, in, the extent to which we can influence the people whose lives we contact, the more they are likely to take hopefully the good things from us and, and try to live in as well. If I had to develop a curriculum for teaching morality, <laughs> I got a different question for you though, because we're all students of color and we're all students of female gender, um, color or female gender. Um, as a trailblazer in higher ed and in research, what are some of the professional <laughs> um, lessons that come to mind that you can give these young folks because we I mean I think we there is so much theoretical stuff that we learn from so many wonderful um, female professors and professors of color. We don't necessarily get a lot of opportunities to learn professional etiquette or know how that you guys went through. And I kinda wanna I don't know whether this makes sense to you guys, but I think it's important to try to get an understanding of what it meant to be a, 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 a man of color in higher ed, in international research, and what were some of the lessons you could teach some of us, as so many of these guys are going to be breaking down walls. Oh, I just made a comment. Oh, yes, oh, yes, yes. Do you want to call that? She probably just passed the George W. Book. Great. Um, someone's gonna come out for a second. Okay. I grew up in a period where many parents <coughs> told us that if we wanted a reasonable chance in the world we would have to be better than other people. We have to try harder and we have to set up our standards higher. I think a part of my success is related to the fact that I happen to have been born in a period that made me at the right age to benefit from opportunities that grew out of the civil rights struggle. Sometimes tell my kids I'm not sure that if I had been born 20 years later that I would have gotten this high, in part because the competition had been much, much keener. And, uh, I moved into higher education in the late 1940s. Intelligent, reasonably well educated, uh, of actually hard working black people with some speakers that produced lots and lots of opportunities, although those opportunities. 
to be a professor at Yale uh, one of the senior professors at Yale called to ask if uh, she could come to visit my house and she did and she wasn't a person who was known for being terribly uh, progressive or open to black people I think I learned that she was very worried psychology department that Yale was about to hire, but hasn't. What she had come to my house to see was how well I would fit in. The same thing happened when we moved into the interracial community that I was telling you that we lived in. We got a visit from a preacher who was a member of that community. And at the time, he was representing himself as very much interested in our FNM. But then we later discovered that, that he also was sent by some of the more liberal members of the community to see whether or not we would get in that community. And I think I learned from that that as repulsive as the here behind that kind of exclusiveness may be that if you're trying to break into a community that isn't necessarily anxious for you to be a part of it, you know, coming in fighting may not be the way to do it because the resistance uh, can be too great. You know, each of these settings where I have I said to all at once, I'm not sure where I ran into the sudden scene, but it says Those who the learning how to sacrifice who I am for what I want to become. Learning how to sacrifice what I am for what I want to become. And when I first read that one, I was troubled by it because I'm a person who believes that we are not always be true to ourselves. But a part of who I am is also a part of where it is I'm trying to go, what I want to do. And if I'm so busy fighting you know, the sexism of us males, or the racism of you know, the white society, of the exploitive intent of rich folk, that they don't fight their lives long enough to let me get in the door. I'll, I'll never get in Now the trick is to not get so accustomed to accommodating the situation in order to become a part of it, that you continue to accommodate just in order to stay there. In each of these situations, once I've got in, I've seen my role to, to bring some other people like me uh, into it, but I could never have uh, made the progress I made into the, the third year and to increasing the representation of women and black folk there if I hadn't got in to get into a position to do so. So my advice to you is number one, do your homework, try to be prepared. And number two, try to figure what your priorities are. And if you know what your goal is, there's a civil rights series of videos keep your eye on the prize. Keep your eye on what it is you're trying to, uh, to achieve. And there are some things you're going to have to give up in order to And I, I guess it was two years before I went to Yale, I was invited 
to submit my name, by my credentials at uh, Harvard. And I have this, I still have this letter that I wrote to them, uh, making certain demands, because I knew the situation in Harvard. And of course, uh, I have successfully, uh, I think, prevented them from <coughs> inviting me to return as a permanent, permanent member of the club because they didn't want to meet all those conditions. When uh, the opportunity for Columbia and for Yale came, I was less uh, s s strident in my demands for the conditions under which I come. And of course, I was invited to uh, Columbia. The trustees had to or the resolution, because one, could, one condition I did set was I was not willing to give up tenure to come to a non-tenured position. And at that time, Columbia didn't make its initial, initial appointments for tenure. You had to be here at least a year to get tenure. Uh, but they did. They were against the, the back was against the wall, because this was 1968. And that was too late in the game, but uh, I ended up being the first person of color that Columbia gave tenure to. We're still protecting that domain for white folks. Uh, but uh, that was the only condition I made in the net now. But uh, the Harvard invitation, I was so independent that I succeeded in not getting the appointment there, and of course it uh, was bright enough to not make all those conditions in here, and once I got there, they pretty much turned out. You know, they gave me an endowed chair and all the things they did for the person. I suspect I would not have done it if some people had thought they were getting a black nationalist as opposed to a... Sure. And that's a touchy, touchy subject case. My wife, who was a very, 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 very independent person, when I was invited to join the National Academy of Sciences, they had just uh, squashed a report on the impact of uh, fat consumption on uh, human health. And they had been pressured, of course, by the meat industry uh, not to release uh, this report, but uh, simply cited the fact that scientists had known for at least 20 years before that that the consumption of animal fat was deleterious to the whole. So Susan said, you know, Ed, I don't think you ought to accept it. Yeah, I don't think you ought to join the academy. It's, it's too corrupt, and so I declined. In retrospect, I think I should have uh, accepted, and I should have been trying to democratize that institution, institution and changing its uh, policy. It was later when it was the National Academy of Education that was trying to become uh, more democratic, uh, despite the fact that there were things in their history that I could certainly attempt to. I didn't come in before they admitted me uh, with my agenda. I accepted membership and went to work on uh, changing the color, the politics of that organization, and did not be uh, elected to the executive committee. Secretary Treasurer was able to turn it around from the inside, which I could not do to the National Academy of Sciences because it was a bad So, how much you let me invite me back again? Yeah. <laughs>